Okay, everyone, welcome back to the JPA podcast. I'm with Andy Little today. Andy, how are you? I'm very good. It's great to be here. Thank you very much for, for uh, jumping on with me. Of course, man. It's, it's great to be at your studio here as well, mate. You've got a, a great little setup and um, obviously you're catering to a lot of golfers as well, mate. Yeah, no, the, the set was pretty cool. So uh, a, a studio just outside of London, it's three bays with a bit of a membership, but uh, obviously for myself, uh, it allows me to stand in front of the camera and, and do uh, do a lot of the online lessons and uh, have the, the data and the feedback for, for my clients around the world, so it's good. Definitely, and um, for those that don't know you, mate, do you mind taking us back to what got you into golf, uh, then golf coaching, and where you are now with a combination of both face-to-face and online coaching too? Yeah, so uh, golf has always been in the family. Um, I was basically, a, dare I say, a toddler with a, with a club in my hand. Uh, I had a, a half-brother who was, uh, well, is nine years older than me, and uh, both our parents uh, were uh, playing. Both our dads played golf, uh, so I was very young getting into the golf course. Um, I think at the time I was like six, seven, was playing on a par three golf course, and then uh, with a very sort of supportive parents, um, my, my dad would take me to the golf club at least sort of twice a week, go to the drive range a couple of weeks. Got quite good quite quickly, so I was a single figure handicap by the time I was uh, 12, uh, and then sort of stumbled a little bit. If I look back, I wasn't quite as dedicated as some others. <laughs> uh, sort of grew up in the same sort of area as, say, Justin Rose. So uh, I remember playing in the North Hants Junior Open and, and Justin was off scratch and I was off about a, a seven or eight handicap at the time and was just worlds, worlds apart <laughs> difference and it definitely highlighted. So um, turned pro when I was 18, so turned pro straight away, left school at 16 to work in a golf shop. Uh, turned pro, did the PJ straight away and, and I think when I qualified when I was 21, I was one of the uh, the world's youngest qualified PJ professionals at the time because I just did it straight away wow. and was fortunate to uh, to pass it. And by that point, I sort of got into uh, into some junior coaching to begin with. Um, I was uh, a shop boy for uh, my first sort of couple of years. And then where I was based, they uh, asked if I should jump onto the coaching side of things, which I jumped at the chance. Uh, but because I was in my training, uh, they had a, dare I say, a fairly silly rule that you had to be a qualified professional to teach adults. So I was only allowed to teach the kids. So uh, unfortunately, quite an inexperienced Andy was uh, thrown the most important generation of golfers, which is quite a backwards way of looking <laughs> at it, but it's just what happens in the golf industry. So um, I jumped into junior coaching, um, quite a good sort of energy when it comes to, uh, to coaching the kids and good about patience. So I was connecting well with the kids. Um, and then I sort of moved locations uh, where there was 13 of us and 12 pros hated teaching junior coaching. So I sort of saw an opportunity to dive more headfirst into junior coaching um, and then created a, a, a junior coaching company called Little Golfers, which originally was just school-based. So this was sort of just before the London Olympics mm. where there was a lot of funding. So uh, schools were reaching out to me with this sort of pot of money that they could use from the National Lottery. So I would be going in to teach uh, some of the kids uh, through um, um, their sort of like break times after school activities. So it was a way of, of the sort of showcasing golf to kids that haven't had that experience before. So that was a fantastic opportunity. One term, I had 55 schools on the books and had a few coaches working underneath me while the funding was around. Uh, and then the, the, the business had sort of developed, um, moved into a golf club environment, uh, still doing junior coaching. And uh, we had it at one stage where I had about 140 kids uh, coming on a weekly basis, which was amazing. Then more recently, have sort of jumped into the online world, uh, more from a, a personal perspective, trying to get a bit more of a, a nice work-life balance. Um, I've got a, a, a family at home that I still wanted to spend some time with rather than uh, being in the drive range all the time. Uh, and then the, the, the world of Skillist has sort of opened my eyes to what is possible. And, and again, I think part of why I've been successful is, uh, dare I say it, my coaching style, but also maybe hopefully my sort of personality traits, my communication skills, uh, and, and then just connecting with sort of the average golfer uh, and then again just obviously it's a, a snowball effect once once we started to see a bit of traction through uh, some online clients it obviously it's the snowball effect where they talk to others and then it sort of just builds up to that so uh, yeah we're we're in a we're in a nice position we, we like where we are at the moment we're, we're, we're doing all right you forgot to mention number one on skill yeah two, well <laughs> yeah they, you know, that's that's I, I i'm very grateful for where i am so yes yeah, number one on skillless uh 
Golf Monthly, the magazine here in the UK, uh, ranked me as a top 50 coach uh, a, a, couple of, a couple of years ago, which obviously is a nice little accolade. Uh, and then I've tried to, dare I say, try to further my sort of development. So I've gone through the, the TPI system and, and done level one, level two, uh, which is online and went out to the States to do level three last year. Uh, and then even more recently, I've sort of jumped into the 3D world where I've started to do the sports box AI and I've done level one already and then sort of halfway through level two. And again, from sort of like the online world, trying to offer as much as possible. So as much as I can do the 2D analysis and, and help them with their game. Uh, I've also got a bit of understanding about their the body movements through the TPI stuff. So I can do some physical screening and, and hopefully help them that way. But then there are things in the 3D world that you can see that you can't see in the 2D world. So then hopefully linking all that together. And, and again, even Skillis have connected with Arcos. So now I'm getting golf course data from my subscribers. So then hopefully sort of complete the package. So when they're talking about wanting to hit their ball a bit further and a bit straighter, we can actually pinpoint sort of certain things through data on the golf course that maybe they don't need to actually hit the ball further, they need to hit the ball more accurately <laughs> uh, to obviously how their body moves from the TPI stuff to putting a number against their body movements through the 3D stuff and then obviously then using the 2D stuff as well. So hopefully completing everything together. That's wild, isn't it? How much data we have access to these days coming from <laughs> probably where you started to now you've got 3D motion capture, you've got a, a Zoom call there if you want one, you've got um, all of these bits of information. How do you use it? So try to use it as simply as possible. Yeah. I, I think there, there is a lot of uh, information out there and I, I do think that there's, uh, for the average goal, for too much information. Uh, and that's where I think a lot of people get lost down the whole YouTube rabbit hole where they're, they're exposed to so much information and, and coaching ideas and philosophies and, and data points and the idea of the, the, the perfect golf swing by hitting certain points. It's then taking that data and that information available to you and then only telling the golfer in question what they actually need to know uh, and trying to offer it in as much as, as simple as possible. So most of the data, my subscribers, my clients will not even need to see it or hear about it. Yeah. It's, it's just something that I'll keep in mind. And then if it comes appropriate that I need to then uh, show them that information so they're aware of it, then so be it. But the majority of the time, as simple as possible, I think is the way forward. Correct. And um, I think Tiger Woods has some pretty explicit words about people watching YouTube because there are so many, yeah. <laughs> there are so many videos. People aren't exactly sure what is right for them. So let's say if someone's listening to this now and they think, oh, okay, I need to work on my golf swing, so I need to get better. How do you structure a, a lesson or a, uh, I guess an assessment because you offer sometimes a, a screening process or an initial lesson? Yeah, so I, I think understanding obviously what the ball is doing to begin with and yeah. then you've got to try to, then you've got to work back to what the root cause is. I think um, every golfer can video their swing, every golfer can look online and see a golf swing and they can they can pinpoint what it looks and what is wrong within that look. But the problem is the way that someone moves is normally a reaction to something that's already happened in the swing. Yeah. So it's, it's, you know, when someone early extends, for example, when they see their, their bodies moving towards the golf ball, nine times out of the 10, they're not just early extending because they're early extending, <laughs> they're early extending as a reaction to the majority of time for being steep in transition. So they're trying to save their golf swing. We are, we're too clever as human beings that we're, we're always trying to get club face on the golf ball in a square position. Sometimes it means we need manipulation and a lot of compensation. So I think where people start to struggle is they, they see themselves and they can see themselves with a fault, then they go online and then someone will obviously uh, offer a tip, offer a bit of advice. And, and I'm not saying that the tip and the advice is wrong, yeah. but then they start to fix an issue that is later down the chain. So, you know, when I'm dealing with a, with a, with a client or a potential new student online, it's then going through the whole golf swing. Most of the issues start with setup. And if the setup is not uh, of the root cause, it genuinely would be potentially something in the backswing. And if the backswing is still looking good, then obviously then it's something time with transition and then into the impact. Generally speaking, if you're trying to improve a position at impact, the, the root cause is way before that position. So you're, you've got to find that thing. And then it's, it's building an understanding with a person of what the process looks like. It, you, know, you know, you shouldn't be just offering 
one bit of tip or one bit of information. It's like, well, to start with, we need to sort out X and Y. But when you're sorting out X and Y, your golf ball may be going in this direction or in this direction, and these are the reasons behind it. But once you're feeling comfortable with X and Y, well, then you can move into into the Z to then hopefully sort of fix everything. Yes, you're always trying to improve the ball flight. And obviously, at the end of the day, not everyone's going to fit in that sort of model golf swing, you know, the, the, the Adam Scott, the Tiger Woods in his prime. But it's understanding of why someone moves in a certain way. And all they're trying to do is trying to get club on golf ball consistently, which again is the... If, if, if we could sell uh, consistency to a golfer, I think we'd, we'd be all be multi-millionaires. But I think the majority of where people get lost in the YouTube is they're searching for the wrong issue. They see the issue within their golf swing, but that's not the root cause. It's finding out what the root cause is, which is when, like, when I've had uh, people reach out to me, I'm trying to explain to them that the online world for them is their YouTube channel. Like, you know, you, this is, I am going to be your personal YouTube channel. (laughs) Every bit of information, every video that I send you is your personal YouTube channel. I'm sending different YouTube channels to, to everyone around the world that I teach. I'm not sending out generic information. Yes, there are obviously drills that help, but not everyone's getting the same drill at the same time. And I think that's where the average golfer can get a bit lost in the old sort of like online YouTube rabbit hole. Yeah, I love that. And it sounds like you have a really clear system. Like you said, you've got your setup, backswing, transition, impact, like you're you're building throughout that phase. And similar to what I do with my clients was an assessment piece. And then we've got goals, whether it's, you know, mobility first, then strength, then power, then speed. It sounds like you've got a a clear idea of, of where you're going with that. In terms of practice, you must obviously have a lot of awareness of like the skill development and especially online how do you how do you work out um, when to start giving people new drills and how fast? Is there a clear cut way, or is everyone a bit different in the way they develop? I think everyone's a, everyone's a bit different. Obviously, everyone's got, uh, for example, everyone's got different sort of hand eye coordination skills. So uh, I could give uh, the same a bit of advice to two golfers, and you would clearly see that one golfer, golfer A, is going to take to it quite easily. Uh, golfer B may struggle for a, for a period of time. So one of the things that I uh, I do a lot is as much as I give them lessons or whenever they send me a video, I also monitor their practice, and I think okay. half of that is is just keeping them on track. I think a lot of people, whether it's having an, even having an in-person lesson or an online lesson, what they are doing practice-wise, that's when, they, again, they can lose. So they understand, they, they leave a lesson, they've watched a video, they've had an in-person lesson, they've got their key points to work on. But those feels that they were experiencing in the golf lesson, if they don't touch a club for three, four days and they go to the driving range, recreating those exact feels that are going to help them for their golf game can sometimes get lost. So if I give someone a lesson today, and I've sent a video and they've got a drill to work on, I specifically ask them to send me a video of them, A, doing the drill, and B, of their normal golf swing the next time they practice. Now, if that is tomorrow, I will then watch their swing again just to make sure of how close they are to what we're trying to achieve. And more often than not, because feel is definitely not real, they feel like they are doing something crazy different. And then they've even told me before I even watched the video, they're like, they send me a message and I'm like, I thought I was doing this, it looks exactly the same. And I think, and again, it's very common, but I think half the time, if they can get that reassurance that they're either on the right track or they need a little nudge in a certain di- direction, whether it's exaggerating the move a little bit more or changing it. So I think from a, a development perspective, everyone's going to be individual, but I think it's very much based on obviously what the ball flight's doing. So if the ball flight's moving in a different direction, you may have to change direction in terms of your coaching, but also the golfer has ownership of their feelings and their uh, structures. So for example, whenever I change someone's grip, it feels horrible. And I, and I will literally, and I, I apologize every time I change someone's grip. And I'm like, I'm really sorry, you will hate me. You can swear at me. This will feel awful yep. for a period of time. But once it starts to feel more comfortable, they will often like, they will come to me and be like, oh, okay, like my left hand feels better where you know I've moved it over a little bit or it's less, less strong or whatever it may be. And then I think that's when you can then start to implement it. But I think I try to do it little and often. I, I don't think a golfer should be overloaded with information. Um, if I can give a golfer one bit of information that will have a benefit to their golf game, I will give them one bit of information. I think sometimes if you have, and I think this is quite a lot with, with young and new coaches, where 
they want to sort of show off their expertise. They yeah. want to show off their knowledge. And I think if, if you're if you're having a golf lesson and the, and the coach that or the pro that's giving you a lesson is, is telling you three, four, or five things with your golf swing, that's like three, four things too much. Like sometimes I've even had uh, a, a client send me a video and, and they'll, uh, they'll be like, I've played really well at the weekend. I was driving it great, da, 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 da. These are my videos. And I will literally reply, well, just keep doing that. <laughs> like, like not saying that their golf swing is perfect, but sometimes a golfer's confidence is huge. Like, you know, we, we can be as, as up as high to the sky and we can be as, as low to, to the ground when, when we're not seeing the results or we're seeing the results that we want. Mm. And I think confidence has a huge part of. So if someone is confident and they're hitting it well and their timing's on and they're feeling great about it, I think half the time it, the coach should just step back and be like, that's, that's great. Well, let's maybe look at your putting. Let's maybe look at your chipping. If the swing's good and you are happy with where you are, that just needs to roll. Yes, of course, if it starts to go off, then come back to me straight away and we'll sort you out. But I think sometimes, like, a young coach can just just blurb too much information. And, and again, I think we understand the terminology and we understand the reasons why golfers do certain things and why they do, but we need to put our sort of our mind into the, the average golfer that doesn't haven't had years of training, hasn't had the qualifications that we've had, um, and we need to sort of, dare I say it, dumb it down. And if it means that we are not giving any information because they're feeling good, then I think that's that's the right thing to do. There, yes, we can always improve, but like we're not always constantly on that road of change, 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 change. Yeah, I love that. And I've certainly made that mistake in my profession as well. And I think it's pretty normal because you, you learn all these skills in your PGA training, you've got all this information, you just want to just throw it all out because you want that person to get better as quick as possible. But like you said, being able to try and do three or four things at the same time, it's near impossible. So I think simple is definitely the key. But can we go back to practice? And I like how you said you monitor practice. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of golfers do it poorly. <laughs> I've, I've certainly done it poorly. Um, I think it's one of the worst practice sports because people go to a, the driving range, pick up a 7-iron, hit 50 balls at the same target with no variability. <laughs> How do you like your clients to practice? So I, I try to encourage them to do it into a third. So into I've got, the third? Yeah, so we have block practice, yep. random practice, and then sort of, as dare I say, sort of a games-based practice. Mm. So for example, if I had uh, someone practicing on a simulator, I would... Uh, it, if they're working on a particular feeling or a drill, I'll be like, well, for the first third of your practice, I want you to do those drills. I want you to maybe hit a seven iron on the same position all the time. So if they're on the driving range, same target, same shot for 20 minutes, if they've got an hour. Then I'll, for the next 20 minutes, they can still work on those feels, but they need to be changing clubs. You know, They need to be getting comfortable hitting a five iron with those feels, hitting a drive with those feels, hitting a pitching with those feels. They, we all get to the stage where they have a favorite club and it's the one that they use a lot. And that's why a seven iron tends to be the favorite club in most people's bags, just because they've used it all the time. They should be, <laughs> they should be developing those feels and that confidence with all the clubs in the bag. So for the next third of their practice, uh, it should be a bit of random practice. And again, I think sometimes that also then can slow down the practice. Um, you know, whether they don't have their golf bag directly next to them, it's sort of at the end of their bay. So they're forever having to sort of step away from the hitting position change clubs then they can go through a bit of a pre-shot routine process so they they're starting to practice a bit like on the golf course you're right we don't practice on the same environment so we do all this practice away on the drive range we get comfortable on the drive range but then go to a golf course and we have no we have no confidence because we've not been practicing on it so once they've done their block practice and even block practice if someone was doing a drill i would be encouraging them to be like we'll do two swings with a drill and then show me two swings just hitting it normally but trying to incorporate those feels that yeah. you're doing in the drill. You don't want to be doing 10 minutes of drills and then trying to do 10 minutes of the, that trying to feel it because by the 10th minute, you've, you've kind of lost that feel again. So reconfirming your, your mind and your muscles of what you're trying to achieve in that particular drill would be great. <laughs> and then really, I think the last, last bit of the practice, the last third of the practice just needs to be Garrett game based. Now you can do it a couple of ways. So obviously on a, on a simulator, there's going to be golf courses that you can play. So, you know, just playing nine holes on, on a golf course around the world is, is great. And again, that brings in that sort of random practice element. But if you don't have technology at the driving range or a simulator and you're practicing on a field or a range without it, then trying to maybe just play your local golf course. Like, you know, if you've, if you've got a golf course that you've played numerous times and you know that on the first hole you tend to hit a driver and then you tend to hit a seven iron, well, hit a driver, 
have an <laughs> estimate of where it's gone. If you've hit it well, it's probably a seven iron. If you haven't hit it quite as well, then maybe hit your six iron. And if you absolutely smoked it, then maybe hit an eight iron. <laughs> and then you can just go through mentally that sort of process. So, you know, from a, a tournament perspective, if you've had the opportunity to um, play a practice round where you've got, uh, you know, we can all go on Google and, and find the golf course and the and the uh, and the scorecard that we're about to play we can then potentially go through and there are apps that obviously will show us gps exactly what the golf course looks like so then we can we can then prepare ourselves practicing but i think breaking it down into a third allows someone to practice but also practice a bit like they're going on a golf course as well mm. which i think is half the battle yes that's where i think people get uh, get lost because they do the block practice repeatedly because they were trying to get better but then they can't translate those skills into a golf course environment. So their scores don't relate to how their practice has been going because they've not been practicing. They've been practicing golf swing, not, not golf course or golf, golf shots, isn't it really? Yeah, and that's such a good point. Like obviously you need to try and get that practice to a point where it's game-like. So yeah. when you go to the course, you've got that bit of confidence there. Let's have a, a change in gears now. You've mentioned obviously your, your business with the junior golfers. Um, I assume that you still work with the fair amount of juniors as well for someone listening that might be a golf coach or a parent how do you approach overarchingly um, the junior category of golfers so so for like i've got a, a 15 year old son as well so i can come to it as a bit of a parent <laughs> as, at the same sort of time um but the, the the number one priority is enjoyment for the child yeah. um um they, they need to be enjoying the activity in a safe environment obviously so so safety of the of the of the group or the individual needs to be paramount as well but i think for kids kids are, are taught too much like an adult and it's got better over the years and, and don't get me wrong my, my first junior coaching uh back in the day were very much sort of everyone had one one uh a bucket of balls, they had one club in their hand and I would walk up the line, start at one end and would give every child a bit of individual help, but they're all doing the same thing over and over. So it was just block practice for the whole time. Yeah. Um, and the poor kid at the wrong end of the line would get like <laughs> one minute of my time because I hadn't quite worked out the, like the, the, the time left correctly. But whenever I'm doing uh, in-person junior coaching, it's, it's creating a, an environment, it's creating an atmosphere, it's creating games basically. So the, the, the coaching side of things was so small it was more setting up an environment setting up a challenge and going well how can you achieve that challenge how can you hit that shot between those two marker posts or to that particular distance and and especially a lot of the putting games that i would do wouldn't they involve even a golf hole it would be in, in like maybe putting into an area etc but i think the other thing which i found that's really successful is even if you if i've got an, an hour long session with a with a group of six seven eight year olds then there needs to be there needs to be a lot of varieties. There needs to be a lot of change. So in in one hour session, I would want kids to be playing five, six, seven different games. One of the things that I went on a, a training course years and years ago that's always stuck with me: a child's attention span is one minute of their life. So if you've got a, a five-year-old, they will be able to keep their attention for about five minutes. Post five minutes, they're going to start to drift off. Now you don't need to do a lot. You could, you could play the same game but change one of the rules and it sort of resets that timer. So I would have my six games that they're going to play in an hour long and I'd be like, right, well, the maximum is probably going to be like six, seven minutes yeah. because they need to be swapping around. And you nearly want to get to a stage where the child doesn't want to move because they're enjoying it too much. Okay. And I think then, then you're always allowing that child to want to come back. So if I, if I tell them that they need to move and they've enjoyed that experience, and obviously as a coach, you, I know what games worked well. You know, you know from the sort of the buzz of the group that if it, if it worked quite well, you could use that as a bit of a carrot. And again, from a, from a behavioral management perspective, that could always be a game that I would say that would play last <laughs> if the behavior was well and deserved it. But, so I definitely feel that keeping kids safe, but making sure they enjoy it and um, something that I've done with my with my own son, like my son Blake is, is autistic and golf in theory would be the most perfect sport. Team sports don't don't work for him. There's too much noise, there's too much going on. It, it unfortunately leads to sort of him having a bit of a, bit of a uh, dare I say, sort of a meltdown, so to speak. So golf would be amazing. Now, I've never pushed golf on my son. Uh, he obviously knows that I'm a professional golfer and knows that I'm, I'm not bad. And I've always, it's always been child-centered. So if my son wanted to play golf or wanted to go to the drive range, 
then we would go to the drive range. Um, hasn't always happened very often. And there's definitely been spells where he got into it and then has dropped out. And I've never pushed it back onto him. It's always been an option. So, you know, uh, you know, but Blake was at an infant school when he was, say, five, six years old and I was doing a club there and he would do it with me as well and enjoyed it, but never really did it outside of those times. Um, my son, uh, just in about the last month, has shown another interest. We actually yeah. went to uh, we went to the driving range. I had a tournament that I wanted to go and hit some balls at the golf course, and I was just sort of dragging him along. I was with him. I was like, "You've got to come with me this time." Um, I was like, "We'll we'll get you a drink. We'll get you a snack. You've got your phone with you. You can sit and just play whatever you want. Watch YouTube, whatever you want." Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, not golf YouTube. But, <laughs> um, but whilst we were there, and I had no expectations, he actually asked to hit some golf balls. I didn't even have any clubs for him, so he used mine. But he sort of enjoyed it. To the stage that uh, yesterday we actually played nine holes at a golf course, um, and again, to make it as fun as possible, you know, I was like, right, you can drive the buggy. Yeah. So uh, if you drive sensibly, you can drive the buggy. And I was like, right, we can start wherever you want. So we actually began the first holes 330 yards, and he was about to put the ball on. So he was like, no, no we won't start you here, Blake. I, I, like we'll start you much further down, yeah. so you got a chance. And he actually from 150 yards, he hit the green in one shot, and I literally <laughs> my jaw literally dropped to the floor, but. We, as we went round, he then, because he was feeling good, he then wanted to start from the, the team positions, which he ended up doing. So it's very much from a, from a parent perspective, it, from their listening, is you need to not push golf. Golf needs to be an option. Mm -hmm. Like if you're trying to get your child interested in golf, it can't be pushed because they will just push the other way. And that, unfortunately, I've seen that a lot through years of coaching where the kid just doesn't want to be there. Like the, the, the parent pays, the, the plays, and was obviously desperate for their child to want to be a golfer and they push, 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 push. And we just get to a stage where the, the push just pales, it repels the other way. I had an experience, and this was a long time ago, but I had a girl that got to uh, England standard stage and she absolutely, a fantastic golfer. She was like, you know, 15 years old, um, single figure handicap into the England squad. And unfortunately, when she got into the England squad, that's actually when she dropped out the sport. It wasn't because um, she didn't love golf. She just sort of didn't like the pressure of what golf was putting on her. She didn't like the pressure of what her parents were putting on her and what, obviously, the expectations that were putting on her. So she had played golf all through her sort of, like, young years, through her teens, got to a really good stage, and then just, just fell out of love. So I think managing, like, as much as we as parents want our child to play golf because we love golf, we can't then push that love of the sport onto the child unless the child loves it. But also, I think what I find is, like, my expectation of golf is playing on an 18-hole golf course, full-size golf course, etc. Like, for a long period of time, my son's expectation of what he loves as golf is crazy golf. Yeah. He likes crazy golf. Yeah. Uh, he, can beat, he can beat his dad. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's sort of it's, it's a fun environment. But it, to him... Crazy golf was his level. He didn't want to go any higher. He didn't want to go to the drive range. He didn't want to go to a golf course. He didn't want to do pitch and putt. Crazy golf was his level. And I think if you have a child that plays any form of golf, whether it's in school with plastic clubs, crazy golf golf courses, pitch and putt golf course, they, they, they will have their own version of what golf actually is. And I think if they're happy and you're happy that they're playing golf in any capacity whatsoever, then that should be what the, the sort of the drive is. And if it means later down the line that, you know, they end up wanting to go to the drive range or they want to go to a golf course or a full-size golf course, then it's amazing. But I think some of the reason why kids drop out is us as parents, we love our children, we want them to, to have an experience. And if we try to push that experience, onto, and if the child doesn't want it, then they're not going to do it. And like, you know, at the end of the day, you've only got to look at what was your favourite subjects at school will generally be your favourite subjects because you were very engaged and you wanted to learn because you enjoyed it. Mm. You know, my, my dare I say, my, my lesser subjects at school, I had no interest, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> barely made it through English, but I just didn't, I didn't have any focus. So like if my parents were going to try and push English on me more and more because I needed, and again, through love, they want me to obviously improve my knowledge and improve my, my results, etc. But I would be repelling away from the subject because I didn't want to do it in the first place. I think if if you've got a child that starts to repel, you just need to sort of hold back and let them sort of come to golf rather than pushing golf. Have it as an option, but it's there if they want it. I love that. And I remember reading um, Podrick Harrington talking about this, and he said 
his family, when he takes them to golf, when they're enjoying it, he says, all right, we've had enough for the day. So he'll take them off the course wanting to go back. And he'll take them to the clubhouse, buy them a pie or a bowl of chips or something. So they really are enjoying that whole experience. And it's not just the golf, it's the communication around it and the community around it, which is a, a massive part. But also, Matt, I won't take too much of your time, but because you see hundreds of golfers online, probably thousands at this point now, but uh, you must see a lot of people and their improvement. Have you got some takeaways for those listening to try and really accelerate their improvement? And that's a very big question and you can take that however you want to, but have you got some hot tips for people to take away? I think what you have, for, for obviously improvement's gonna be different for different people. I, I, I think if you've got uh, an inspiring tour player that, I, that I've taught, then improvement to them is gonna be quite result orientated um, because they're looking at scores, they're looking at results that they're playing in the tournament. From a, a beginner golfer, an improvement may be just striking the golf ball up in the air. I think this is where improvement's gonna be individual, but then you need to talk with the person what their goals are and what their expectations. Uh, and it's setting very achievable goals where they're just sort of hitting the stone, you know, one by one as they go, it's like, you know, a weight loss journey you know if they want if someone wants to lose a stone in weight well the first goal is losing the first pound and that should be the the goal in question if you are doing the right things on a day-to-day -day basis so if they're practicing in the right way if they're taking the swing tips on board if they if they're getting lessons and dare i say sort of staying to the process and the plan of the coach that they're working with then those processes and that, that improvement will happen i think it's it's difficult to put uh, a number on someone's progress. I know we all want to break 100, we want to break 90, we want to break 80, we want to break 70, etc. And everyone's going to be on a different level of that sort of spectrum. But when you start to put uh, an actual number on a, on a, on a target, then you, you'll start to encourage a lot more extra pressure. And I think when you're playing a round of golf and if you're starting to get close to, dare I say, at that target, then you're, you're setting yourself up for failure. I, I think improvement is just going through a process so if you're going right well today i'm going to go to the drive range i'm going to practice correctly i'm going to work on the drills that i've been set and if i've then finished the day and i've achieved what i wanted to achieve then that is progress you know that, that is achieving improvement because you've done the right thing it's it's when you say i'm going to spend a week um this week i'm going to spend an hour of my putting practice because i'm losing shots in my putting and then going to the driving range and spending a, an hour on the driver or hitting drivers and not doing anything with with your putting because that's the weakest link then that's not progress that's not improving i think setting small achievable goals and it is as simple as like just going to the drive range once a week or staying at home and working your putting that can obviously then allow you to then tick off those little boxes as you go rather than this big target where you're going to become a tour player or you're going to break 70 in the next two years like you obviously the, you see it a lot with like the uh the road to scratch you know obviously like on social media where people are sort of journaling their journey from a certain handicap to a to a scratch handicap well, obviously that's great and obviously it's fantastic for content but like they've they've put a number at the end of it and i think it's it's more they should be like well watch me consistently go to the drive range, consistently <laughs> work correctly in the gym, consistently work on my fitness and my flexibility. And, and it's then that's gonna give you the progress where the end result will naturally happen because the processes have been in place to begin with. I think putting pressure on yourself is just gonna make it too difficult. Correct, correct. And um, before finishing up as well, you've done your TPI certifications and um, obviously you probably understand the screening process. And I'm very biased as a physio. Uh, mm -hmm. I like talking about the body and I like to discuss how it relates to the golf swing. Um, obviously, fitness and golf's quite new in the grand scheme of things. You had figures like John Daly, and yeah. <laughs> he doesn't take care of himself as, as much as a guy like Dustin Johnson would. But do you have discussions with your clients about fitness and their improvements as well? Probably not as much as, as I should. And again, because it's quite a, quite a new thing, but... Um... It, it, it sort of goes hand in hand. Like every, every golfer comes to me, they want, they want to hit straight, they want to hit further. And uh, they'll obviously get to a stage where technique can only take them so far. Uh, and then sometimes their body is limiting their progress through limited range of motions, body limitations. And it's then it's having those conversations. I think most of the time it's just making them aware. I think a lot of golfers aren't aware how much fitness can improve their golf swing and, and what they can actually do for their golf game. So I think it's just opening that door of that line of communication, 
Have you thought about having a TPRI screening? Have you thought about if your shoulder can externally rotate enough? Have you thought about maybe if your hip joints can actually rotate like we're trying to get you in the golf swing where you are struggling? So sometimes what I find is I don't force it down their necks, but if I'm looking at someone's golf swing and I see a limitation, for example, in their, in their hip, or I see a limitation in their separation between upper body and lower body in the downswing, then I will maybe throw in the sort of the TPI screening test and be like, well, can you actually, can you, can you show me, can you do this move for me? Yeah. Because if they, if they can't do the move, then as a coach, I can't expect them to achieve the, the position or the movement in the golf swing. And then it's making them aware where they get that sort of light bulb moment that, ah, oh, maybe I do need a couple of exercises to improve my stretching and, and so forth. So it's, I think it's a conversation that needs to happen more often than it does. And I think, um, I think golfers need to be made sort of made aware that, you know, if they wanted to hit the ball from 150 mile an hour ball speed to 160 or even from 70 to 80, that just having a slightly uh, better movement pattern through technique, but also through fitness can definitely make a, make a huge difference on the golf ball. 100% agree, mate. Mate, you've been so good with your time. Um, where can people find you, reach out and uh, get in contact? So uh, social media wise, my at is allgolfpga. Uh, from there, you would find all my links for any sort of online coaching, uh, website, etc. So uh, yeah, obviously, DMs are always open if you want to reach out with any questions that you've got and would obviously ha happily help anyone that's interested. Perfect, mate. Thanks so much. I great. appreciate it. Hi, love that. Thank you very much, mate. No worries, mate. And um, everyone, thanks very much for listening and I'll see you next time.